It's a great pleasure to introduce and welcome Rink Nuland to, uh, to the uh, webinar. Uh, Rink is a, a Dutch researcher at the University of Amsterdam Medical Center. He comes into the extracellular vesicle field from the field of coagulation. He's been extensively um, experienced in, in characterizing particles in, in the circulation that are important for coagulation and obviously uh, vesicles are, are very much involved there. And today he's going to speak to us about that and how, uh, I think he's going to talk about how vesicles can be very, very dangerous sometimes. And he says in his introduction how they can be even as dangerous as COVID-19 virus. So it's a great pleasure to welcome you. Rink, uh, over to you. Okay, thank you for this uh, kind invitation. The title of my presentation today is Extracellular Vesicles and Coagulation, Blood, Sweat and Tears. Um, I'm Rien Newland, I'm from the Vesicle Observation Center in Amsterdam. We have a collaboration between two departments in the hospital. One is the Department of Clinical Chemistry and the other department is the Department of Biomedical Physics and Engineering. And together we have a strong interest in extracellular vesicle research. And we have four topics, isolation of vesicles, detection of single vesicles, functional characterization and standardization. And with regard to the studies on vesicles and coagulation, they belong in the functional characterization. So the main question is, why do cells produce vesicles? Uh, a clue came from studies already performed in 2005 and perhaps even earlier, showing that bacteria can exchange messages between the bacteria and uh, these messages are stored in extracellular vesicles. So one bacteria releases water-soluble molecules in the vesicles which are taken up by uh, recipient bacteria and this message is translated. And a few years later, also several papers came out showing that also uh, eukaryotic cells can exchange information via extracellular vesicles. And this is one of the first or the first paper that came out from the group of Jan Lutval showing that genetic information is exchanged between eukaryotic cells. Here you see this, this uh, envisioned, you see that one cell is releasing vesicles containing genetic information which are taken up by a recipient cell, and the recipient cell uh, changes gene expression, etc. Now, it's a very appealing concept, but I have two problems with this concept. One is that if you look at the presence of vesicles, they're also abundantly present in body fluids like urine and saliva, etc. And it's difficult to imagine that such vesicles are involved in intercellular communication. There's also another problem, and that's the, the problem of the wrong dimensions. This is a slide prepared by Edwin van der Poel. You see here the concentration of vesicles estimated to be present in normal body fluids like plasma and urine, uh, and it's plotted against the diameter on the x-axis. On the top right, you see exactly the same data, which is now presented on a logarithmic axis. You can fit these data now, and you can make calculations about the surface area and about the volume of the vesicles. Now, if you look at the total surface of extracellular vesicles, when you calculate this, it's about 55 square millimeter. And it's a surprisingly large surface. And in fact, uh, just to give you a sort of uh, handhold, um, if you look at monocytes, look at the type of leukocytes present in blood to the normal, uh, physiological conditions are present in your blood. The total surface area we calculate is about 40 to 400 square millimeter uh, based on the reference range of monocytes. So vesicles have a total surface area which is about the same as the low end of the monocyte. But then if you look at the total volume of the vesicles, uh, you see a surprising difference. Whereas monocytes have a total calculated volume of 600 to 6,000 nanoliter, vesicles only have a total volume of about 5 nanoliter. So there's a sort of mismatch between a very large surface and a very small volume. And to, to summarize this slide in one picture, uh, my conclusion is that I would not consider vesicles as real big shoppers. 
in, when you go to the supermarket, uh, you need something that can store a lot of goods and not uh, just a few small items. So, and just two examples from the literature, from the old literature, that the service of vesicles is very important, uh, is actually at the time that vesicles were discovered. The first paper is of Chargaff and West, and they showed that plasma, when it's free of platelet, generates thrombin, so it generates clotting, triggers clotting, uh, and the rate of this thrombin generation can be reduced by prior high-speed centrifugation of the plasma. So what this paper showed for the very first time is that there's a subcellular factor smaller than platelets present in plasma. The factor promotes clotting and you can pellet it. And that's the theme you will see over the years coming back. Now, the second example is of course the very famous work of Rose Johnson uh, and their group showed that vesicle externalization, so shedding of vesicles, production of vesicles, may be a mechanism for shedding of specific membrane functions, which are known to diminish during maturation of reticulocytes to erythrocytes. So in short, what they showed was that the redundant receptor, the transferrin receptor, it's no longer needed on mature erythrocytes and it's dumped by vesicles into the environment. So vesicles are being used as a sort of waste bags. Now, if you look through the literature, also even recent literature, and you look a bit through your, the, the, the eyes of your, uh, the hairs of your eye, you see that vesicles uh, in various way are involved in protection. And every time the relevance of the surface pops up, it can be coagulation, but also for example, comp complement activation, waste disposal, as I just showed, etc. So what is coagulation? Now, coagulation is part of hemostasis, and hemostasis is a process which causes bleeding to stop. It's the first stage of wound healing, and this involves coagulation, blood changing from a liquid to a gel. Well, this is of course just text, but in daily practice, if you have a wound, you end up with a wound crust, and the process in between is called hemostasis. The most important function of hemostasis is not to stop the bleeding, but it's to, to restore the intactness of your skin of your, uh, and to keep your uh, milieu interior separated from the milieu exterior. So in fact, what hemostasis does, it prevents microorganisms, black bacteria and viruses from entering your blood and making you sick. So that's the most important function. So the faster a wound is clotting, the more it protects you as an organism. So that, that's something you have to keep in mind. Now, how does coagulation work? What is coagulation? Now, here on top, you see the gray bars are represent endothelial cells, so the, the, the cell lining of your blood vessel. The material in between, I think I can show it to you here, is the exposed subendothelium, blood flows over this, the first thing that happens is that blood platelets immediately adhere to the collagen and other fibers which are present. In the next step, blood platelets shape, uh, changing their shape, they secrete compounds that attract and activate other platelets. And here a very loose platelet plug is formed. And you can imagine that a little bit by just putting brick on top of each other. It's not stable, but it's the first attempt to, to stop the, the bleeding. Now, and then the process of coagulation kicks in. Coagulation is a sort of mortar production. It results in the end in the production of fibrin strands. And fibrin strands here represented as red threads, they're insoluble and they stabilize the plate plug into a thrombus. And a thrombus is something that is stable. Yeah? So clotting is the process that leads to the formation of these insoluble fibrin strands. Now, what are the coagulation requirements? Well, actually, uh, if you, in a very simplified, in a very simplified way, the requirements are that you need calcium ions, you need coagulation factors, you need a substrate fibrinogen, which is soluble and which is converted to the insoluble fibrin, and you need a surface. Why do you need a surface? Well, clotting factors are abundantly present in plasma, but to activate each other because they're 
present as inactive enzymes, they need a surface. And on a surface, they, they, you can say they go from 3D to 2D, they can easily activate each other. And vesicles, for example, are an ideal surface to promote uh, activation of clotting factors. Now, all these factors are ubiquitously present within your blood. And still, as you are sitting here and listening to this talk, your blood does not clot. So why does your blood not clot? Well, here you have, again, a very simplified clotting cascade. And the end product, the final active enzyme of the clotting cascade is thrombin. Thrombin is the enzyme that cleaves fibrinogen into fibrin, and fibrin is insoluble, as I told you. And there's one element missing in this whole cascade, and that element that is called tissue factor. And tissue factor, and this is what you have to keep in mind, it's a transmembrane receptor, so it does not simply, it's not simply present as a soluble protein, but it's only associated with membranes. And tissue factor is a transmembrane protein, here depicted in blue, that binds clotting factor, factor seven, this clotting factor, and it's, uh, yeah, it catalyzes the autoactivation of 7A, and then clotting can start very efficiently. Now, the question, of course, is when you have a wound, where does the tissue factor come from? Well, as I said, tissue factor is absent in the blood, but it is produced constitutively by extravascular cells. So when you have a wound, tissue factor can come from extravascular cells. But does it also come from body fluids? And how about licking a wound? Well, already uh, quite some while ago, we published a paper in blood showing that human saliva from normal human subject like you and me contains uh, high numbers of extracellular vesicles that expose this, uh, this transmembrane protein tissue factor. And actually in a, in a couple of, I think, quite simple experiments, we could, I think, very clearly show that this tissue factor is demonstrated with vesicles. This is just a few examples, but if you take cell-free saliva from three healthy individuals, down to one, two, three, you subject the cell-free saliva to different centrifugation speeds and you look at the pellets and the supernatant and you stain for on the Western blood for tissue factor, you can see that there's a lot of tissue factor, at least in some individuals, that you can pellet uh, very easily. So it's associated with membranes or something that you can pellet. And in fact, here by electric microscopy and unicold staining, you see that tissue factor indeed is present on the surface of extracellular vesicles in saliva. The question, of course, is, is it active? Does it really trigger clotting? Yes, and I think it's remarkable activity. Here we are measuring the optical density at 405 nanometer, simply in an ELISA plate reader at 37 degree. At TS0, we add calcium to the plasma. This is normal human plasma. And um, at this, at 0.2, just, just a low stable curve, the plasma remains fluid. But as soon as the plasma clots, the turbidity will increase and uh, it becomes a gel. And what you see is almost at the moment that you are adding vesicles from saliva, normal human saliva, almost immediately there's a strong increase here. So the plasma becomes turbid, it starts to clot, and here the plasma is fully clotted. So plasma goes from a fluid to a gel by adding vesicles from saliva. And this is remarkably active. We compared the activity of vesicles from normal human saliva to a snake venom, and the snake venom is, uh, contains a protein that's called reptilase, and reptilase directly converts fibrinogen into insoluble fibrin. That's the fastest your blood can clot, and in fact, it doesn't make a difference whether you add saliva or you add a snake venom, it's the maximum speed your blood clots. So your own saliva is, uh, as, 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 yeah, is a strong, is a huge, is a very fast trigger, um, for regulation similar to, uh, to a snake venom. So it, it's really very active. And the, the remarkable thing is uh, for me as a biologist that this tissue factor activity is not only retained to saliva, but you also can measure it easily in human urine, um, but also in sweat and tears. And we, you see medical students from our university who are cutting onions on the lab bench, uh, trying to produce tears. Uh, and, and we also collect sweat. And 
the experiments we have done with saliva years ago, you can easily reproduce with sweat and tears. So what I've shown you now is that a physiological condition, just as, as you are listening to this talk, your blood should not contain vesicles, the tissue factor, but other body fluids like saliva, sweat, tears, and urine do have such vesicles. Now, hemostasis, as I told you, is the process that protects you. It, it tries to uh, restore your milieu interior. It tries to prevent microorganisms from entering the wound. But there's a second problem. There's also a sort of dark side, and that's thrombosis. Thrombosis is the formation of a blood clot inside the blood vessel, obstructing the flow of blood through the circulatory system. And now it's important, there are two very different types of thrombosis. There's arterial thrombosis, thrombosis in arteries, myocardial infarction and stroke. And there's thrombosis in veins, which as a common name is called venous thromboembolism, and which on some slides I have abbreviated as VTE. Now, uh, all these kind of form, these different forms of thrombosis are very common diseases and they are amongst the, the diseases that most of us will die from when we are old. Yeah, myocardial infarction, but also venous thromboembolism are often lethal. So again, I would like to focus on the tissue factor uh, exposing vesicles, but now in venous thrombosis. And I have a few introductory slides and then I come back to the vesicles. Now, venous thromboembolism is an important problem, and especially uh, when it's associated with cancer. And just to go through this slide, venous thromboembolism is a, is a common name for deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism, so it comprises both diseases. About 10 million new cases each year, third leading cause of facial disease after acute myocardial stroke, so it's a big disease. Lots of money involved, many risk factors, including um, cytostatic, but also surgery, immobilization, and cancer. And about 20% of the new cases of venous thromboembolism are associated with cancer. And of all the patients with cancer that are taken up in hospital, it's a second cause of death. So it's, it's really an important disease or comorbidity. Now, the problem is that clinicians are not allowed to treat all patients prophylactically because there's also a bleeding risk and not everybody will develop a thrombosis. So clinicians for a long time have uh, realized the need that uh, it, it would be nice if you could identify those patients who will develop venous thromboembolism in the future, because if you can, then you can give the medication uh, before the thrombus develops. Now, how do clinicians identify such patients? Well, they have clinical prediction scores, and depending on the scores, they apply certain clinical decision rules, and then a patient has the scores high or low, and when the patient scores high, the patient will get uh, thromboprophylactic therapy. Now, one of these very famous scores uh, in the clinics is the Corana score, uh, and as you can see, uh, it's a type of cancer, the site of cancer. Uh, so some cell biological and biochemistry parameters are often involved. You get risk scores here, and depending on how much risk, how high your risk score is, you will be treated or not uh, with uh, thromboprophylactic therapy. So. The question is, do these clinical prediction scores really predict future venous thromboembolism? Now, this is a story uh, that uh, came out a few years ago uh, from the group of Hadi Buller. Hadi Buller is one of the hotshots for uh, venous thrombosis research, and he is also in the Amsterdam UMC. And what we did is um, we compared several risk prediction scores for future venous thromboembolism in cancer patients. So it's a multi-center study, it's a prospective study. Four commonly used clinical prediction scores were tested. Primary outcome is venous thrombosis at six months follow-up. Almost 900 patients involved, of which 6% developed venous thromboembolism. And uh, many different types and stages of cancer were involved. So it was a really broad study. What was the conclusion? Very simple and straightforward conclusion. None of these four uh, 
clinical prediction scores make any sense. They didn't predict anything at all. So it was time for a plan B. Now, from already even old literature, we know that many different types of tumors express tissue factor. And this is just an uh, example of ovarian cancer, different stages from A to D, uh, and it's, uh, the expression of tissue factor is shown in, in dark brown. So uh, again, there are more tumors producing tissue factor. And the amazing thing is that if you go back to the old literature already in 1981 and 1983, it was demonstrated that if you culture uh, cancer cells in vitro, they produce vesicles, the vesicles are coagulant and these vesicles expose tissue factor. And this is, by the way, very nice old papers to read, very informative. Now the question is, can you use uh, a tissue factor vesicle-based clotting assay is a very simple whole plasma clotting assay. Uh, can you use such an assay to predict venous thromboembolism? Well, in the study I just showed you, in a slightly smaller study within the big study, uh, we tested our assay. So what we did is, it, it's the same study, uh, but now uh, it's not uh, almost 900 patients, but of these 900, 650 patients were involved. Uh, 6.2 developed venous thromboembolism. Uh, and what we did is we uh, compared the four clinical prediction scores to our very simple vesicle based clotting assay. So, how does the assay work? Plasma is recalcified. Uh, keep in mind, it is, has all been done fresh in different hospitals. Some were very handy and some hospitals were less handy. So, we, did, we had quite a big spread in the data. Uh, the experiments were performed, the clotting was performed in the absence of presence of an inhibitory antibody against uh, coagulation factor 7. We could also have used an inhibitory antibody against tissue factor, but because it was more expensive, uh, we, we went for the cheap option. Uh, this was an unfunded study. And in uh, a previous study, we have determined that if there's more than 13% prolongation of the clotting time by this antibody, uh, we consider the patient a high risk. Uh, and when there's less than 30% prolongation, we consider the patient as low risk. So what came out? Uh, and actually that was, well, it, it was it completely never done. I also did not, we, we never saw the data. Uh, and, and, uh, but when it came out, I think there were two striking conclusions. If you go here to the Corana score, and this is in a subset of pancreatic cancer patients, these are patients who really are at high risk of developing venous thrombosis, you can see that when you look at the hazard ratio 0.43, meaning that if you have a high Corana score, so if you score high, you have a twofold reduced uh, risk of venous thromboembolism, which of course doesn't make any sense, and of course it's also completely not statistically significant. So, so th this doesn't tell you anything. The other most widely used score is the Vienna score. And you can see uh, the hazard ratio is 1.7. So if you score high, you have a 1.7 fold higher risk. But if you look at the p-value, it's again completely insignificant. It's like throwing a, a coin. But then if you look at the clotting assay, the patients who score high in our assay have a 4.2 fold higher risk of developing venous thromboembolism, and it is significant. Well, of course, it's still not, not perfect, but compared to these clinical prediction scores, I think it's quite well. But keep in mind, this is within the group of the pancreatic cancer patients. Now, there's something that I didn't tell you, but already for a few years, people think that depending on the type of cancer that you have, there are different pathways primarily responsible for developing uh, the thrombus. And as you can see in pancreatic cancer, it is indeed the vesicles exposing the tissue factor. And this is studies that have been done in mouse models, very convincing studies. Uh, there's ample evidence that indeed vesicles exposing the tissue factor are involved in uh, venous thromboembolism when you have pancreatic cancer. But this doesn't hold true for these cancers. Now, in our cohort, we're also about 100 patients with lung cancer. How did our assay do there? Well, as you can see, these were the data I showed you for pancreatic cancer patients. And if you look at the lung cancer patients, you see that um, 
we can absolutely not predict anything in the same group. You see completely insignificant and has a ratio of 0.9. So it seems that the assay for sure has some specificity. Uh, it seems to work in the pancreatic cancer patient, but not in the lung cancer patient, which based on the literature uh, you would uh, expect. So coming back to this, this simple overview, uh, when you look to pathology, yes, there can be tissue factor exposing vesicles within the blood, such as, for example, cancer. And just, uh, I didn't fill in these columns simply because I think in general it has not been studied. Of course, likely they are positive, uh, but to the best of my knowledge, it has not been, not, not been studied yet. Now, um, you have to keep in mind that it is not only during cancer that patients can have vesicles exposing tissue factor within their blood. It's a very old study, 1997 from Circulation, where we showed I think for the very first time that patients during open heart surgery can also have vesicles exposing coagulant tissue factor within their blood. And actually what we showed at that time that if you isolate these vesicles and inject them in rats, the rats will develop a thrombus and you can develop, uh, you can block this thrombus formation by antibodies against tissue factor, but not by an irrelevant antibody. So also during surgery, such vesicles can come into the blood. Uh, we also have an old study that uh, these vesicles are also associated with, with uh, sepsis, uh, uh, a septic shock. Uh, and in these patients, uh, there is so much tissue factor uh, in the blood that every clotting factor and, and fibrinogen is completely um, yeah, consumed. And in fact, uh, there these vesicles are associated with bleeding rather than with thrombosis. Now, um, just actually, I, I saw it yesterday or the day before, but um, we have been asked to, to uh, enter a study in, in the AMC or, uh, because one in three patients uh, that has, uh, that's COVID-19 positive and stays at the intensive care unit also develops uh, arterial or venous thrombosis, which is an extremely high risk. Uh, and I think the mechanisms uh, explaining development of arterial thrombosis or venous thrombosis in these patients are completely uh, terra incognita. And final slide, I think one of the final slides. Um, it's, it's important to keep in mind that within ISEF, we have uh, now uh, attention for standardization. This also holds true for other societies who are interested in vesicles. And um, for example, the ICH is also interested in standardization of these tissue factor assays um, because uh, they think it may be of real clinical relevance and without any standardization, uh, we are doomed. So in conclusion, um, I think that the vesicle surface and vesicles in general also play an important role in protection, in protection of the cell, uh, but also protection of the organism. Coagulant vesicles are present in normal human body fluid, but vesicles exposing tissue factor are absent in normal healthy subjects. Why uh, do we have coagulant vesicles to reduce blood loss and to reduce the risk of infection? That's what we think. We don't know, but this is very likely to uh, assume. Blood can contain tissue factor exposing vesicles under pathological conditions, things of cancer, sepsis, and during surgery, but there are more examples like sickle cell disease, for example. And I think that a prediction of future from the thrombus embolism using vesicle based clotting assays shows some biomarker potential. So I think. I've tried to convince you that, that vesicles, on the one hand, when looking at tissue factor exposing vesicles, they can have good properties, but they can also be a risk factor uh, under certain pathological conditions. So uh, they have a good side and they have a bad side. Uh, there's a lot of additional information uh, that you can read. Uh, you can also contact me if you have questions. Um, you can also look at my website where I take my trip reports here about.com and we have a website uh, for a new project on uh, the, the standardization of fiscal concentration measurements at netforce.eu. And of course, I would like to thank all the people and all the funders for uh, collaboration, help and uh, finances to do all these studies. 
and thank you for your attention. So what we normally do is uh, we call out people who have questions and they can ask uh, the question themselves, but apparently Vaisa Shekari doesn't have a mic working microphone, so I'm just going to read out the question. Mm -hmm. um, so her question is, since coagulation is basically triggered on plasma membrane, can we say that coagulant tissue factor exposing EV should be microvesicles or ectosomes? It's a very good question, and I don't know. <laughs> uh, what, what I do History. know is that um, if I look at the data from saliva, um, we had quite many large vesicles that stain positive for tissue factor, but also small vesicles for, that stain positive for tissue factor. So I, I really have no clue at all. But it's a very good question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, next question is from Hans van der Poorn. Rank, I was just interested in your prediction studies. Presumably, those patients were at least some of them on blood thinner prophylactics. You wouldn't. So, how does that affect the result? No, they, they were not. They were not. Actually, um, um, just do my speakers a bit louder. Sorry. Um, what? <clears throat> sorry. Um, no, they were not. And uh, what happened was that these patients. Uh, had to enter the hospital for, uh, let's say, new, um, I don't know what, what they did, probably for, for first time chemotherapy admission or something like that. Uh, and uh, at that moment also a tube of blood was collected. So they were not yet on uh, anticoagulant medication or whatever. Actually, it was one of the exclusion criteria. Hey, uh how, uh, Genevieve, would you uh, ask your questions, please? Um, sorry, yeah, I'm not a cat. <laughs> I was just wondering if there are any specific markers associated with this um, clotting promoting EVs. Uh, and what, what, what do you mean? You mean cell-specific markers or? Um, markers? No, I was thinking of surface markers. Uh, no, for, no, no. Not, not that I know. Well, what, what we try to do in a few instances is we try to elucidate the cellular origin of the vesicles exposing the coagulant tissue factor. So, for example, in the sepsis study, we showed that the tissue factor exposing vesicles originated from monocytes. And if you look at saliva, the tissue factor exposing vesicles uh, are mainly from white blood cells, probably neutrophils. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but so, we don't have any idea whether it's really associated with any other. Uh, um, it, by, by the way, it's a good question because we do know that tissue factor is present in some um, membrane um, parts, the resistant membranes, or not in. So, um, but people never really looked at that. The co present of that. No. So, do I understand correctly then that, but the tissue, the factor, is it on the surface of the EV? Yes, it is, it is, it's a transmembrane protein. So, uh, you cannot find tissue factor as a free soluble protein, but it has been known for, let's say, 50 years or so that if you remove cells, uh, there is still a clotting activity in many fluids. Um, and this clotting activity, you can tell it. If you, if you, if you take saliva and you uh, put the saliva in the centrifuge, you can tell it the clotting activity. So you can tell it really the tissue factor there. Yes, it's, it's a very simple experiment. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Clotilde, <coughs> Clotilde, do you have yes. a question? Yes, hi, I, I had the, uh, thanks. Uh, hi, thanks for the, the great talk. I learned a lot. <laughs> and I'm very, uh, <laughs> I, I, know, I mean, I don't know anything really about coagulation. So my stupid question is, do you consider platelets as EV or not? And would platelets have a uh, tissue factor as well? And yeah, that's... It, it, it's a fact, well, this, this is all excellent question. So I remember from the last MICEF paper that I sent in a comment to uh, Ken Witwer and you probably that, by the definition that was applied, that also platelets would be vesicles. Yeah. Uh, I think platelets are not vesicles because platelets really have an entire structure of micro 
tubules, a membrane skeleton, cytoskeleton, etc. And they can change their shape and, and that sort of thing. So, so I'm not sure, and they contain granules themselves in mitochondria. Uh, but to be honest, they don't have a nucleus. So, so in many ways, they, they, they represent uh, vesicles and, and they're also not so easy to, to separate. I mean, what's the difference between a small platelet and a large vesicle? Yeah. So that, that's very difficult. Uh, there have been many, many research groups looking at the presence of tissue factor on platelets or platelet vesicles. And it has always been a very confusing field because some real good research group uh, very clearly showed the presence of tissue factor on platelets and other groups didn't. And I think there are two explanations for that. One is that platelets very easily complex with monocytes. So, and then monocytes can produce tissue factor. So you end up with probably also mixtures of vesicles that, that are partially from platelets and partially from monocytes. And the other thing is that, uh, and we published it years ago, um, if you uh, wash, so there are two old ways to prepare platelets, to, to, stand, to, to SOPs. One is that you isolate platelets by uh, size exclusion chromatography column, and the other is that you wash them. Now, if you wash platelets uh, simply by pelleting and uh, washing, you will remove the supernatant, and the supernatant contains the vesicles. But if, you would, if you're using size exclusion chromatography, which in the platelet field is called gel permeation, uh, then you will have co you will co isolate the platelets and the vesicles. So I think if you look back at the platelet literature and gel filtration has been used by many labs over the years, I think people have been studying uh, platelets uh, combined with vesicles for a very long time. And maybe that is one of the explanations that some groups, by using a different isolation procedure, always ended up with vesicles having tissue factor in, in their platelet preparations and other people didn't. So, food for thought. So, uh, Anna Paulina basically asked a similar question uh, regarding tissue factor on platelets. Other molecules, if I could expand the question a bit, other, so when we looked early in our, the proteome of extracellular vesicles, we could find other coagulation factors uh, beyond tissue factor in extracellular vesicles. Um, so I, I presume there's a whole cascade of, one of the most complicated processes I've ever studied in my pursuit of medicine was coagulation and trying to figure out coagulation. <laughs> Well, um, it, it is, does, yeah. is, you know. Yeah, it, it is it, it's even more complex. Uh, there's old literature also from the 80s and the 90s, also published in JBC from the group of Peter Sims, who showed that if you look at the surface of platelet vesicles and platelets, that platelet vesicles can up to a thousand fold more efficiently bind certain activated clotting factors. Uh, and they're very convincing studies. And these clotting factors are needed to amplify the clotting cascade to, to speed up the velocity. So um, it could even be that, let's say, platelet vesicles are the surface where all the clotting factors assemble, and, and, uh, or platelets even, whereas the tissue factor is present on other vesicles. We, we just don't know that. Uh, that we, we've done uh, experiments that we published um, uh, one or two years ago. It's quite quite interesting that if you, um, if you have platelets that adhere to a damaged vessel wall, these platelets will become activated and then the platelets start to expose certain activation molecules like P-selectin. And they can use this P-selectin to trap vesicles from the blood exposing tissue factor, for example, vesicles from saliva. So if you add saliva vesicles to platelets on a damaged vessel wall that exposed P-selectin, then the vesicles will bind via ligand to P-selectin and tissue factor is really delivered at the spot of, uh, of uh, vascular damage. And that also has been shown a long time ago in a paper where people showed that if, if you have a damaged vessel wall in animals, platelets adhere, platelets expose P-selectin, and then when tumor cells are passing along, they expose and tissue factor and the ligand for P-selectin. They, they bind to the spot of vascular damage and you have a local accumulation of tissue factor and uh, well, 
clotting can occur. And keep in mind that the end product of the clotting cascade thrombin has two functions. It, it converts um, fibrinogen into fibrin, but it's also the most potent platelet activator that we know. So, and then you end up in a sort of, well, very complex loop. So, uh, thank you. Pia, you had a question? Uh, and Kalyani, if you post your question there, we can, we can let you in when, when you... Pia. It wasn't really a question, it was just a comment to Clotilde's uh, question and, um, uh, and to add what Rink said is, is that uh, platelets are capable of protein synthesis, they carry uh, their own RNAs and uh, they also shed EVs. So if we think of a platelet as an EV, then uh, can EVs uh, do, is there protein synthesis taking place in EVs in general? And can EVs generate other uh, EVs? Sort of like this uh, Russian doll kind of metaphor. So therefore, I will classify platelets as non-EVs based on these two properties in addition to what Rink said. Just a comment. Rink, you want to respond to that? No, no, no. I, I, well, it, it, it's interesting. One of the things I always I would like to investigate is that um, we, how, how active vesicles are. So I fully agree with Pia. So I think platelets are really cells, but they're very aberrant cells. Oh, by the way, there's another thing. Um, people often call platelets thrombocytes, um, uh, which, which is wrong. Uh, because birds have thrombocytes, because if you look at platelets in birds, they have a nucleus. So they have sites, they have thrombocytes. In, in humans, or in, maybe in mammals, it's very different. They are anucleated. So I have no clue why, why that is, um, but, but it's, it's good to keep in mind. And yeah, I think they're really, uh, they're really small cells, but very aberrant, yeah. Just a quick comment on, on Pia. When we uh, discovered RNA in exosomes more than 10 years ago, one of our hypotheses was that they were protein factories outside of the cell. We tried to, to look for such a, a but we could not doc document any protein production. Still, the RNAs are shuttled and can, can be functional. So that's uh, maybe not the final, uh, the final answer to that, but, but so far we have been unable. Ka Kaliani, could you come in? Uh, yes. Uh, so hello, Rink. Um, hello. So my question is more out of curiosity. Uh, so I being a nature enthusiast, so the one thing that just uh, caught my attention was the lancet snake. So, uh, so, med so there are several types of snake venoms and uh, one of the type is the neurotoxins. So of course they inhibit blood clotting. So do you find any applications of these EVs which are encapsulated with certain antithrombotic drugs or these TV enca T TF encapsulated EVs as antivenoms. And also the second part of my question is that um, the research has been going on on using the snake venoms for cancer treatment. So do you feel, do you feel that these EVs find applications in, in, in the cancer therapeutics as well? Oh, that, that's all very difficult questions. And I'm not sure whether I have any sensible answer to your very smart questions. Um, but one, one of the things, very basic things, is that the snake venom, the snake I showed you has a, I told you it has a protein in its venom, it's called reptilase, it's an enzyme that directly converts fibrinogen into fibrin. And actually, to me as a biologist, it makes sense that if you have a snake venom and a snake bites, let's say a mouse, that the mouse will have thrombosis and die on the spot and the snake can eat it. But if you look at most snake venoms, they contain compounds that do exactly the opposite. They prevent blood clot formation. And to me, maybe it, it's a digestional thing for snake. That's something I don't understand. And I have no idea uh, about your other questions, um, whether you could use it or not. Um, our, so far, we have only been interested in can we use uh, a very simple, straightforward vesicle-based clotting assay in the clinics? Um, and I can tell you now uh, that, that many things actually went wrong in our 
study, uh, but we, we have had we have many improvements now in this clotting assay. So I think if we if we would be able to do it again, and there's already another clinical study running, then I think we uh, we we may get much better results. But your question, can we use it for treating or medication or drug delivery? I have no clue yet. Don't know. Thank you, thank you, Ring. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, so there's a question from Genevieve about uh, hemophilia treatments from extracellular vesicles. Um, do you think biofluid EVs could be used for wound healing purposes? Hmm. <laughs> well, it, it, it is a good question. Uh, <clears throat> Dogs lick their wounds, right? Dogs lick their wound, cats lick their wound, and um, uh, I can I can tell you it's it's confidential, but we 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 are just on the brink of of submitting a paper uh, that uh, also um, um, human mother milk contains these vesicles with tissue factor. But the interesting thing is that uh, there's one of the old uh, very very famous patent researchers is Edward Glansman, uh, and about. 60, 70 years ago, he was working in Austria, which was at that time the, the, the hotspot of the world for uh, hemophilia research and hematology research. Um, they showed at that time that if you take uh, clots that are soaked in mother milk and you apply them to wounds, for example, uh, at hemophilia patients, that the bleeding will stop. So, uh, unfortunately, the literature is only available in German, but it's it's very tempting to speculate that also saliva and other fluids would do exactly the same. Yes, so let's say for external use, uh, when not too many bacteria are around, I think it uh, it has been done already in the clinics 50, 60 years ago. Yeah, so for sure that could be an application. Alex had a more general question, which I think is interesting. Why don't you uh, unmute yourself and and ask a question live? Alex, please go ahead. Okay, we can't hear you yet, so I'll, I'll read the question, which is a general one. Um, so he's thinking about COVID treatment and the use of plasma or antibodies, basically, to treat uh, COVID-19 patients. Um, the question is, is plasma as a source of EVs can that have epigenetical effects in the uh, in the disease process? Complicated question, I think. Ooh. But I don't know. I'm, I'm sure there must be one listening now that knows more about this than I do. I have really no idea. Yeah, I mean the, the whole concept of antibodies working. Uh, I, I I don't I don't have a view. I, I'm following the evolution of information around COVID-19 fairly, care fairly carefully. And they are trying to treat patients with COVID-19, severe COVID-19 with, with plasma or, or antibodies from patients that undergone the, underwent the, the disease. So uh, we don't have any information about how that works in a, in a randomized way or, or whether the EVs can, can contribute to uh, to what happens in the recipient. So I think the randomized studies that are ongoing, we will have information fairly soon on that. I think I just, I just like to yeah. add a little bit, like if we think yeah. about it as a, a normal blood transfusion, so that's a, 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 about the same thing. So I guess it, it might have uh, some effect, but blood transfusion is proven to be safe. So I guess we can hope that it's, safe enough in this case and if that is like the the most um the closest treatment we have at the moment perhaps that's what we have to try any any more questions one more from pia from the cancer point of view why promote coagulation why would well, cancer cells promote coagulation it, it it's a good question um so it's in, so I only told you that tissue factor triggers clotting, but tissue factor is also known as, as growth factor and as a very important angiogenesis factor. So it has different functions. 
And for example, one of the, the, the riddles of tissue factor is that we don't know whether it can switch from one function to the other and how it would do that. But what we also know is that I think some tumors uh, surround themselves in, in fibrin mesh works so that they cannot be attacked by the, uh, by the immune system. So, uh, and in that regard, uh, expressing tissue factor, producing tissue factor and making a sort of fibrin harness around you, protect you from the environment. So I think it's a clever strategy of uh, tumor survival. Thank you, Ring. Do we have any more questions? If not, before we hang up, could I, uh, I had a lot of fun last, yesterday. I had a conversation with Ken Whitworth and I recorded it for a, for a podcast about the similarities of COVID-19 virus, SARS-CoV-2 and uh, exosomes or exocellular vesicles. I will go live today and, and please have a look. It was, it was uh, quite educational. Uh, Ken knows a lot about viruses and their similarities with EV. So uh, I'll, I'll post it on, on, on Facebook soon. Thank you. Nice. Carolina, you want to wrap yeah. up? Uh, yes. Uh, so yeah, um, I had to lock the meeting today uh, at the beginning because of that pop-up coming up on uh, mm -hmm. Ring's presentation. So um, yeah, uh, I think I just have to apologize to people who came a little bit late, but uh, we just have to do it. Otherwise, it's going to interfere with the whole presentations. And um, apart from that, yeah, I hope uh, everyone stays safe. And actually today, I have to mention that this is a triple O, double O seven, double O seven presentation for Web EV Talk. So Ring is our double O seven. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you, uh, Rick, and um, yeah, I'll see you uh, next week. <laughs>